It's really wonderful to be here today. Um, I am going to talk to you about the marriage of business and social impact. I'm going to talk to you about, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have a different way of thinking about social impact now, thanks to technology. And I'm going to start by telling you about some of the problems um, that we're trying to solve. So right now, there are more than a billion people living on less than $2 a day. That number is adjusted for purchasing power, so that's what $2 would buy you uh, in the U.S. In, uh, in the modern era. So it's quite a large number of people living in absolute suffering. Uh, 300,000 avoidable maternal deaths annually. These are deaths that the World Health Organization believes that could be prevented quite easily if women had access to proper maternal care. A very large number of people, almost a billion people, living without clean water. And uh, about two and a half billion people lacking access to basic sanitation, which is one of the biggest challenges with health in the developing world. So quite a large number of problems. Our traditional approach to dealing with these problems has been charity. This is a photograph of Mother Teresa. You all know Mother Teresa. She's actually uh, done most of her work in my mother's hometown of Calcutta in India. My mother actually worked for Sisters of Charity, Mother Teresa's organization. And the traditional thinking behind charity is that there's always going to be suffering. It's important to honor the poor and to try to alleviate their suffering in the immediate here and now. And Mother Teresa even went so far as to say that she thought the world would be helped by the suffering of poor people, that it's important to empathize and connect with that suffering. While she's obviously done many good things in the world, I think that this way of thinking has held low-income people back. And I think that we have an entirely new way of looking at charity and social impact before us thanks to technology. So I'm going to start by telling you about one of those people who lives on less than $2 a day so that you can get a sense of, of who these people are living at the base of the economic pyramid. This is a woman named Jacqueline. Uh, she is in northern Uganda. I met her about three and a half, four years ago. And she was orphaned by the AIDS crisis in northern Uganda. She comes from an area that has been under a civil war for the last 20 years, recently emerged from the civil war, and was made most famous by the work of Invisible Children, uh, who produced a, a video about Joseph Kony, the warlord there, and his abduction of young children as child soldiers. So most people, when they think of northern Uganda, they think of this horrific war, they think of child soldiers, they think of pe people victimized by that war, and by a number of other health crises that, that were linked to the lack of investment in the area. So Jacqueline came out of that environment, uh, an orphan at age 10, and then managed unbelievably to get through high school through uh, working odd jobs, um, asking relatives and people far and wide for school fees, and finally she made it to high school. Then she even got into the local university, Gulu University. This is the town that she's in. But like most uh, young people in Uganda, she had no chance of completing university because she couldn't afford the school fees and there are no student loans. So Jacqueline was stuck. Here she was, this incredibly bright young woman who despite all manner of terrible circumstances had managed to lift herself up, get an education, and then she was stuck. Jacqueline represents the people at the base of the pyramid. She is not a charity case. She's not someone who is sitting there waiting for a handout. Jacqueline is waiting for an opportunity. And as soon as one comes her way, she seizes it. So now that I've told you a little bit about, how, uh, about what people look like at the base of the pyramid, let me tell you um, a bit more about how technology can help solve the problem of people uh, like Jacqueline living on less than $2 a day. So traditionally, development required massive investments in infrastructure. We need good roads. We need good waterways. We need access to power. And all of these things are not present in the kinds of places where poor people live. People like Jacqueline live in communities without any of this infrastructure. Yet thanks to technology, we have a new way of connecting people like Jacqueline to the global economy. This is the new world of digital work. In 2005, Thomas Friedman wrote a book called The World is Flat, describing how the internet economy could lift 
millions and perhaps even billions of people out of poverty by connecting them directly to jobs in places far away from where they were born or where they happened to live. And the core idea of that flat world is that for the first time in human history, we can be free of the constraint of birthplace or nationality. No longer does where we happen to be born have to determine our fate. So in 2005, I read Thomas Friedman's book. I was incredibly inspired, and I decided to figure out a way to use the internet economy, the digital economy, to transform the lives of people like Jacqueline. I had spent a good chunk of time in the developing world. Uh, right before I went to college, I spent about six months in Ghana working at a school for blind children and seeing firsthand how poverty was both incredibly demoralizing, <laughs> really sad, and at the same time, entirely fixable. Because I saw human talent, just, you know, people just like Jacqueline, who were desperate for opportunity. So the light bulb went off in my head when I read Tom Friedman's book, and I ended up um, forming an organization called SamaSource a few years later in 2008. SamaSource takes the internet economy and makes it relevant for low-income people. We connect marginalized women, youth, and refugees to work over the internet. And how this looks in practice is that we take uh, big contracts from technology firms mostly, companies like Google, Microsoft, LinkedIn, eBay, and Getty Images. We convince them to give us their messy data projects, and then we put their projects through software that we've built. Uh, we built a system called the Sama Hub that unitizes tasks in these messy data projects and sends those tasks one by one to low-income people. We call that model micro-work. And uh, through that work, we have been able to lift over 6,700 workers out of poverty since we started, a total impact of nearly 30,000 people when we include those workers' families. Another example of a worker who we've helped is Ken. This is uh, Ken Kihara, and I met him about two and a half years ago. This is Ken standing outside of his former house in Mathare. Mathare is a slum, an informal settlement, in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. And it's one of the most destitute places I've visited. Ken and his little daughter there lived in this uh, one-room shack with dirt floors, open sewers outside. There's one lavatory that he would have to walk to in the evenings and uh, was always nervous about getting attacked or getting robbed on his way to and from the bathroom. So imagine trying to raise a child in this circumstance. Ken found one of our local training centers in Nairobi, in the slum, and started learning how to do these computer-based tasks. And what Ken originally started doing is a very basic type of task called image tagging. So Ken would look at an image and identify whether there was a celebrity in that image for a company called Getty Images that manages a huge stock photo archive. So Ken, from this slum community, was able to connect to the digital economy and actually do work for a company based in Seattle and earn more than three times the local wage for doing that work. So this impact uh, on Ken and on Jacqueline has been phenomenal. This is a picture of Ken today. Um, he now makes four times what he made before joining SamaSource. And he's a, a very proud member of the digital economy. Now we've hired him as a trainer to go and train other young people like him in his community. To give you a sense of the economic impact of this model on just one person, um, our uh, worker Jacqueline started off at less than $800 a year before she started working at Sama. She was doing odd jobs. She was uh, from a subsistence farming family in northern Uganda, so she um, made her living growing crops and selling them in the local markets. And post Sama, she now makes over $3,000 a year so an over 4x income increase since she started working with us. She's made so much money through the digital economy that she's been able to take some of her, uh, take some of her paychecks and reinvest them in a pig farm that she started in her home community several, uh, several hours away from Gulu, where she does this work. And she's now hired several local women to manage her pig farm for her. Juliet most recently, or sorry, Jacqueline most recently sent me a business plan for a dehydrated fruit company that she wants to build in northern Uganda. So this is such a different view 
of low-income people. This is such a different view from the traditional model of charity, from thinking that people uh, are, are uh, people like, like Jacqueline are incapable of contributing and must receive handouts. And I think the digital economy is enabling this new way of thinking in very powerful ways. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our relationship with some of these corporate clients, because that's really the underpinning of this business model. We at Samasource consider ourselves a social business. This is a relatively new category. For so long, our uh, economic world has been divided between nonprofits, which we imagine to receive no revenue other than revenue from donations or charitable contributions, right? And for-profits, which we view as profit-maximizing businesses whose job is, return, is to return the maximum value to shareholders. And we've ignored this wonderful middle ground between traditional nonprofit and traditional for-profit businesses, which we call the world of social business. And that is, in my mind, the most interesting part of the economy today, is businesses that think about embedding social impact into what they do, and nonprofits that think about embedding earned revenue models into what they do. So Getty Images is, is one of our clients. Uh, we probably have about 30 corporate clients today that generate over $6 million in revenue for our organization through the contracts that they give us. Getty, when they initially hired us, didn't do so because we were charity. They were looking for a vendor that could reliably tag images of celebrities. And they wanted to make sure that the quality of the data going into their, uh, to their data set was very high because they were selling this data globally to media companies. So we were in a competitive bidding process, and we won. And much later, when I met the CTO of Getty Images and I asked him, why did you choose Sama? He said, actually, we didn't even realize you were a nonprofit until after we started working with you and we started reading some of the press. But we chose you based on the quality of your work. And to hear that makes people like Jacqueline and people like Ken proud. Because again, they don't want to be charity cases. They don't want to be recipients of our pity. They want to contribute to the working world. They want to contribute to the global economy and receive some benefit from it. So this new marriage of business and social impact, I think, is one of the most exciting things uh, to happen economically. And I think it's one of the most powerful ways we can lift people at the bottom of the pyramid out of poverty. It's not just happening in the world of digital work. Many of you are probably familiar with the global fair trade movement, which originated in the 1950s and was another version of this way of thinking. We call what we do impact sourcing, which is a little bit broader than fair trade, but the core concept is that the most powerful way to lift people out of poverty is to do business with them and to pay them fairly and to ensure that their working conditions are fair. It sounds so basic and so obvious, and yet I think the charitable sector has yet to fully embrace this way of thinking. We're now seeing these concepts of fair trade and impact sourcing applied very broadly. Traditionally, fair trade was limited to uh, a couple of commodities. We think of fair trade coffee and fair trade sugar and some of the basic goods that we can buy at natural food stores. But that's a really limited way of thinking about it. Impact sourcing broadens that concept to include companies like Mayette, a new firm that's in the luxury space that designs luxury apparel that's sourced from artisans in developing countries. So they're not selling on the basis of charity. They're not selling their clothes to wealthy people um, on the basis of how much their business model helps the poor. They're selling on the basis of high design and great quality. And they also happen to be big believers in this concept of impact sourcing. I think that represents a real revolution, again, in the way that we're thinking about low-income people and their capacity. There's still a long way to go as far as impact sourcing concerns the digital economy. There are about 100,000 workers globally doing work just like we do at Samasource. Low-income people doing uh, data entry tasks, image tagging, and similar types of digital work. And there was a study recently completed by the Rockefeller Foundation that found that this industry, impact sourcing applied just to digital work, could employ up to 3 million people and account for 25% of the global data outsourcing industry in, uh, in relatively short time. So I think that there is so much potential for more businesses like Samasource to flourish around the world. And I should add that as a nonprofit, we're about two years away from breaking even off of our earned revenue. 
So organizations like ours can actually become businesses in the sense that they can cover the, their own costs through earned revenue um, thanks to these new ways of, uh, of forming business models. So with that, I will uh, close and open it up to questions. Thank you so much.